Bible and turn to Acts, the 17th chapter, the passage that was read just a few minutes earlier, be the basis for our study this evening. In our adult class this morning, we mentioned the difference in the world from when I was a lot younger and what we have today. When I was in school, all my friends and I, we talked about Bible things all the time. And I was raised pretty much around Southern Baptists. All of my friends were Southern Baptists. So needless to say, we had a lot of discussions about God's plan for salvation. But the thing was, back then, we all started with the Bible. And what did the Bible say? We did not agree on what it taught. But that was where we started. And I also mentioned that it's quite different today. My children, when they began talking with their friends, some of them had some knowledge of the Bible, but for the most part, they really didn't know what the Bible taught. And so they had to talk about God and the fact of His existence before they took them to the Bible to to look at the Scriptures. And with this being true today, and just being true more and more often, that the people we run into today really don't have much of a knowledge, if any, of what the Scriptures teach or about God at all, we might say, well, where do you begin? Well, let me just say this much. If we're talking to people who have no knowledge of God and what the Scriptures teach, we're not going to get very far if we just stick with what the Bible teaches and say, well, this is what you should believe if they don't even believe God exists. And I know that's, that's a, an issue for some people. I know from my bringing up, it, I was always taught, go to the Scripture, book, chapter, and verse. But that was in a time where people knew that the Bible was God's Word. They believed it to be God's Word. So when you live now in a world where many people have no knowledge of God or belief in God, where do you begin? Well, believe it or not, the answer to that is in the Bible. It's in the passage we're going to look at tonight. Because when Paul went to Athens, he went to a very ungodly city. Not that they weren't religious, but they were not godly. They did not have any knowledge of God or very little knowledge of God. And so in the, where we ended the scripture tonight, Paul began looking at an inscription on this monument, if you will, here in the city of Athens, that there was a God on every corner. And the the idea in Athens was, you know, we might have missed a God, so let's put up this memorial to this unknown God just in case we missed one. And so Paul saw that and said, let me tell you about that God you don't know. Essentially, that's what our task is today. Because we live in a world that doesn't know the true and living God. And so where do you start? Same place Paul started. I want to look at what Paul did here in Athens as an example and a pattern for us. For us preaching God in an ungodly world. What do we do? What should we do? Let's look at what Paul did. And I believe if we follow his pattern here in the city of Athens, we will do well. Now that's not to say that we're going to save thousands of souls because ultimately the decision comes to those that we bring the word of god to and i'm sure that everybody here is really no different than any other christian i've ever met we sometimes get too wrapped up in how many people have we baptized that's not our task as christians just as paul said i thank god he did not send me to baptize he's not saying baptism wasn't important the important part though is getting the word to lost souls. That's what we should be concerned about. So what did Paul do? Let's let's begin by looking. Notice in verse 16 what he says as he comes into the city. What, What we find is, in verse 16, the Scriptures tell us when Paul waited for them, and that is Silas and Timothy, when he waited for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Our spirit has to be provoked to speak just like it was with Paul. Now, if we look, I'm hoping you can see this somewhat up here. When we think about where Paul was at, this circle 
the wall around here, this is the, the city pretty much of Athens. And you see the area in the middle there. Uh, maybe I should use the, the laser. Which, which one is the laser? Very top, okay. This area right here, that's the Acropolis. That's where, if you look at the top picture up there, that's where the Parthenon sits on top of that area there. And if we go a little bit further here, the area where he's going to be a lot of, doing a lot of his teaching is within the Agora, which is basically like an open area. And if you can go back just a little bit here, that is this area right here. This is, what, this is a blow-up of that area. And if you notice, if you stand in the middle of this, it doesn't matter which direction you look, you're going to see a temple or some sort of monument to their gods. So this is what Paul saw when he comes into the city of Athens. And we might say, well, what stirred his spirit to speak? Well, it wasn't their great philosophical arguments, I can tell you that. We notice in verse 21 that the people to whom Paul was in the midst of and speaking were what we find in verse 21, the Athenians and the foreigners. And what were they doing? Well, they spent their time in nothing else but to tell or to hear some new thing. But Paul wasn't impressed by that, and his spirit wasn't stirred by this great human wisdom. When he stood there in the midst of all of Athens there, and, and on this occasion we find Epicureans and Stoics, as it's noted in verse 18, but Paul was not impressed by that. He didn't come to the city because he had heard of these men and their followers, and according to what he writes to the Colossians in chapter 2 and verse 18, he knew that there was great danger in falling for the human philosophical argument. That wasn't what stirred him. It wasn't their impressive architecture either. Now, if you've ever been to Athens, if you've ever seen a picture of the Parthenon, it, if you love architecture, that's a pretty impressive structure. For them to have built that and others, for it to be standing still today, it's, it is impressive. But that's not what stirred Paul either. Where Paul was standing, he could look around and see all these buildings, and there was a lot of work and craftsmanship put into this. But Paul didn't come to the city of Athens and say, oh, I want to see this wonderful architecture. And when he got there, his spirit wasn't stirred because he said, oh, this just makes me feel closer to God. That wasn't it. It was the rampant idolatry, brethren. Let's read that again, verse 16. When Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. The city was given over to idols, literally filled with idolatry. One of Athens' own satirists, a man named Petronius, said of the city, quote, it is easier to find a god than a man. If you've read Gareth Reese's commentary on the New Testament, specifically in the book of Acts, he says this about the city of Athens, quote, where we are used to, see, in this book, let me just make this point, it's 60 or 70 years old, so some of the things he's going to point to, some of you younger folks are going to say, what's that? But here's what he said, quote, where we're used to seeing street lamp poles, street name markers, fire plugs, and mailboxes on every corner, Paul saw evidences in the idols and altars of the degradation of the city, unquote. At a friend of mine, about 20 years ago, he and his wife went over to Athens. And before I preached this sermon, I, I asked him, I said, what did you see in the city even today? And he said, you couldn't throw a stone, even today, you couldn't throw a stone any direction and not hit some sort of idol or little niche set up somewhere where some, there would be a little idol or some sort of place where people could worship those gods. Now, they're still standing today. So even today, this is true. You, you can't turn around and not see something about idolatry. Brethren, that's what stirred the spirit of Paul. If he heard those philosophical arguments, he was stirred by the fact that they were destitute of the truth. 
if he looked at these impressive structures, he understood it signaled the deception that they had followed so strongly and so abundantly in following false gods. It may have been a combination of all these things. It was the idolatry that moved Paul. What about us today? What moves you? What stirs your spirit? Well, it can't be modern philosophical arguments either. Again, Paul warns in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8 to, to let yourselves not be cheated by this philosophy. And the, the odd part is, is the philosophical arguments that we hear today in, in college-level philosophy classes are from the same writers that Paul had to deal with in the first century. Still today, men are reasoning with the wisdom and philosophy of men, and that's not what should stir us. What should stir us is the fact that men are still caught up in human reasoning and see that there is something impressive in that rather than in the truth, the Word of God. Let's not be in awe of these philosophical arguments, though. Paul was not. And what about our modern houses of worship today that, that we build? in this country. You know, I used to live in North Little Rock, Arkansas about 20 years ago. And every day when I would turn on the radio to hear the traffic report, because I had to go right by this area that I'm about to tell you about. There's the intersection of I-40 and I-430. And inevitably, at any intersection, you know that, traffic is going to build up. And the traffic guy would say, there's a backup at the big church. Everybody knew where he was talking about because it was huge. They had such a big spire that the FAA said you cannot build it as high as you want to because it was in the flight line of the Little Rock Airport. And then while I was living there, another congregation on the other side of town outbuilt them in bigness. In fact, for that year, it was the most expensive structure built in the state of Arkansas. And I can't even tell you all the things that were included inside this building. It was not just for worship, I can tell you that, though. They had a, I'm not making this up, they had a Taco Bell, they had a skate park, they had two stages for putting on plays for the entertainment of their teens, they had classrooms, it wasn't for Bible teaching, though. Are we impressed by those? Have you ever been to Europe and seen some of the old cathedrals that are over there? I was in the military a few years ago, like a long time ago, getting further and further away. I love architecture, and I went to see all these cathedrals because I wanted to see the craftsmanship in these buildings. And I can tell you more than once when I was inside taking the tour of this, I overheard someone saying, doesn't that just make you feel closer to God? That's not what moved Paul, and it shouldn't move us either. Let's not get caught up in the human material side of things to stir us up. We should be stirred just like the Apostle Paul when we see a world around us that has no knowledge of the true and living God, and what we see are lost souls. That's what should stir us. Our responsibility as disciples of Jesus Christ, according to the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 2, verse 24, beginning, is we have the responsibility. And I want you to read that because I honestly believe some brethren don't know this verse is in the Bible. A servant of the Lord. Are you a disciple? He's speaking to you. A servant of the Lord must. And what does that word must mean? You don't have an option in this. Must, I want you to notice one of the things it says in verse 24, must be able to teach. Now brethren, I am pretty sure, John can correct me if I'm wrong on this, that when God expects us to be able to teach, that means He wants us to teach once we're able. So if you are a, servant, or you are a servant of God, that means if you're a disciple, that means you need to be able to teach. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily up here or in a big, front of a big crowd 
or even by yourself, if you have to bring somebody along with you, but you have the responsibility to teach. I'm going to tell you right now, it is, is not just the preacher's job. Is it the preacher's job? Yes. But it is the job, if you want to call it that, of every believer in Jesus Christ. And what I tell people all the time was, if you are a brand new convert coming up out of the water, do you know you can teach? And I've had people look at me funny and say, well, I don't know about that. Well, what am I going to say? Tell them what you just did and why. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. But brethren, we need to be stirred to be able to teach them. So here's the question. Do we sincerely care for lost souls? Paul was. When he came to the city of Athens, he wasn't there for entertainment. He wasn't there to be impressed by the architecture or the philosophical arguments. He knew there were lost souls in this city just like in every city. I want us to also notice that Paul reasoned with them. Notice in verse 17, Therefore he reasoned, therefore, because his spirit was stirred, therefore he reasoned with them in the synagogue with the Jews, with the Gentile worshipers, in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. This is one of those cases where Paul didn't have somebody in mind. He just said, is there somebody out there that needs to hear the gospel? Then I'm going to teach. Are they in hearing distance? They're going to get to hear it. I want us to see that when he taught, he didn't make any exceptions on who was going to be taught. Notice it says Jews and Gentiles. Why did he do that? Romans 3 and verse 23, because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Paul knew that. He wrote those words. He knew that when he came to the city of Athens. So he acted accordingly. He looked around and he said, they've sinned. They need to hear the gospel message. The Jews following the old law needed to be converted to Christ. The Gentiles who followed idols, as in this city, or nothing at all, they needed to believe in Jesus as the Christ. In chapter 26, verse 22, we find that Paul, as he is standing before Agrippa, giving his defense, said he had testified both to small and to great. Paul didn't care who heard the truth, neither should we. And he taught anywhere that he could. Notice, again, verse 17 where did he teach? In the synagogue, in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. He didn't feel like he had to confine his faith to the church building, as people say today. Keep your faith to, in the church building. Like, you can't take it outside these walls here for some reason. Well, brethren, that's the way it's always been. The world doesn't want to hear about God, but you know what they need to hear? These people in the city of Athens needed to hear it. The people in the the city of Oklahoma City need to hear it. People in Rosenberg and Houston, Texas need to hear it. Doesn't matter where we are, they need to hear it. But we also see that Paul taught daily. Notice again, he reasoned in the synagogue, in the marketplace, daily. He didn't feel like he had to be confined to Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and Wednesday evening. Daily. What better way to cover everyone in every place but to have a daily attempt to reach out to the lost? And what did he teach when he went out teaching? He taught them Jesus. Notice again, it said, when, when others heard what he was saying, the latter part of verse 18, they said about him, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Friends and brethren, when we go out to teach, let's make sure that we are teaching Jesus also. Let's do what Paul did. Let's, let's learn from his example here. We need to reason with everybody around us too. We need to teach everyone. And that means we need to heed the warning of James in chapter 2 and verse 1 when he said that we are to not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of God, glory, with partiality. With partiality. That means... We can't look at anyone and say, well, they would never obey, so I'm just not going to I'm just not going to waste my time on that. And I know we say that because I said it once. Let me tell you a story. Let me tell you on myself and I I'm going to tell you after this happened I said I am not going to do that again. 
when I was in high school, again, I was surrounded by Southern Baptists. We had discussions all the time. And one, one of these friends of mine, David, that was his name, we had all kinds of discussions, and we just didn't get anywhere. We had a gospel meeting upcoming, and I was thinking about who I was going to invite. And I, I just kind of marked David off in my head. Ah, he wouldn't come. So I didn't ask him. And Tuesday night, I'm up here at the pulpit getting it ready for the preacher. And I look up, and guess who was in the back? Because somebody else invited him. And I felt about that big. And I, from where you're at, about, about that big. And I told myself right then, I'm not going to do that again because it's not my job to decide for them what they will or won't do. We need to teach everyone, and like Paul, we need to teach everywhere. Notice when Jesus sent the apostles out in Mark 16, chapter, verse 15, they were to teach the gospel to every creature. That means they had to go wherever there was a creature, a human being. And I know some of my brethren are overly cautious about taking the word outside the church building. Some are even hesitant to let others know that they are servants of Christ. But brethren, we're not supposed to be hiding our faith. I know the world would rather us hide our faith, but who are we more concerned about, the world or God? Where are we going to find the lost? I can tell you from all my years of experiences of worshiping in many different places, I've moved around a lot, I found by a wide margin you're going to have contact with lost souls more when you go outside this building than you will waiting for them to come through those back doors. Now I know that's not news to any of you in here, but I also know we, we think that. We'll just wait for them to come to us. I even had an elder at one congregation say, we've got a sign out front. They know where we're at. Yes, they do. But we know that there are lost souls out there in the world. And brethren, that's where we need to go, wherever they may be. And we need to not just keep it here on Sundays and, and teach amongst ourselves. In the early history of the church in the first century, we find in Acts the fifth chapter in verse 42 that the apostles were daily in the temple and in every house they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. In chapter 16 verse 5 we find the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. Why did they increase in number daily? I guarantee it's because the disciples were teaching daily. We have to do the same if we expect to make a difference in an ungodly world. We cannot wait for the ungodly to wake up one day and say, you know, there's a church of Christ over there on May Avenue. I think I'll just go down there and, and be saved. If that ever happens, John, you let me know. The chances of that are pretty slim, though. But you know where you've got a better opportunity? When you talk with the people you know and where you shop where you work I guarantee you there's lost souls there and they need to hear the word too and I know it sounds like a given but brethren let's make sure we teach them Jesus and I know it sounds like a given and, and we, we think in this country well everybody knows Jesus well no they don't I remember years ago and please don't beat me up for saying this somebody in my household had on Oprah wasn't me but I happened to be walking by, and she was, had a guest on that I'm not going to mention the name, but talking about her younger years and how she was mistreated by religious people. And Oprah looked into the camera and said, well, the Jesus I know would not ever condemn anybody. And I, all I could think was, well, the Jesus you know probably wouldn't. But the Jesus of the Bible would. You see, brethren, the, the, the Jesus people know today is not the Jesus of the Bible. It's the Jesus of their own invention. That's the world we live in, and I know we know that. We need to teach them the true Jesus, that Jesus didn't just accept everybody to, and, and tell them, God loves you as you are. You just don't worry about changing. You can get to heaven without doing anything.
without making any changes. That's the world, that's the Jesus the world believes. We need to teach them the real Jesus. Yes, he does love them. And he loves them even as they are, but he doesn't want them to stay that way. He wants us to be saved. When we look at Acts, the 8th chapter, the example of the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch, he was reading the book of Isaiah, didn't understand who the writer was talking about. And so he asked, who, asked Philip, who's, who's the writer talking about, himself or some other one? And you notice Philip began reading at that very scripture and preached Jesus to him. That's what we need to do. And if you notice, preaching Jesus means more than just Jesus as the Christ and Son of God because when they came to a body of water, the eunuch said, see, here's water, what hinders me from being baptized? Where do you hear that? When Philip preached Jesus. So when we preach Jesus, let's make sure we're teaching everything about Jesus. That means whatever Jesus said, we must do. And Jesus said in Mark 16, verse 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. We need to teach the same thing. So are we diligently trying to save others? Teaching everyone, everywhere, daily, and about Jesus? If not, we need to be. We also notice that Paul, as he looked around at the city, he noticed what they were all about. Let's begin reading verse 22. Paul says, Men of Athens, I perceive, in other words, he was paying attention, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. Some of your translations say superstitious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, more than one, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. And again, the picture you need to get here is there was so much idolatry and they were so concerned about covering every God that they were saying, you know, we might have missed one. Let's put up a monument and say to this unknown God just in case we missed one and that way we will appease that God. And Paul noticed that. What he noticed was they were willing to believe in something. They were very religious. It was a misdirected interest. But Paul noticed that and he saw that they wanted to believe in something He was going to take that as an opportunity to teach them the truth, but he noticed that. We'll get to more on that in just a minute. He saw this altar to the unknown God. Again, this to Paul was not something, and I'm going to say this because I've heard this expressed by brethren. He didn't just look at it and say, those poor, ignorant people. There is no use even trying in this town. Look at that, an unknown God. Can you believe that? That's not what Paul was thinking. He saw this as an opportunity to teach them about that God they didn't know. He paid close attention to their habits. But I want us to also note that he was familiar with their own writers. Later, as Paul is telling them about this unknown God, he says in verse 28, In Him we live and move and have our own being, as some of your own poets have said, for we are also His offspring. Whoever this writer was, he he was an unnamed man. He was not inspired by the Holy Spirit. But Paul quoted him because whatever this writer said was true. Did you know that the truth can be found in people who are not inspired by the Holy Spirit? Now, I've got a lesson I do every once in a while. I said, even the Pharisees were right. Sometimes, you know, like the the old saying, even a stop clock is right twice a day. (laughs) And that's for the old style clock, by the way. Not those digital ones. Well, I don't know, they may be right too. He he saw truth in the words of uninspired people. There's nothing wrong with knowing some of the writers of our day. If they're speaking truth, use that. Because this is something that, that the society knows about. You say, you know that old John Grisham guy? You know once he said this? That's right. It's truth. And then you can point them to the Scripture and show the depth of that truth. I want us to see that all of Paul's efforts here, as he looked at this idolatry, he did not just shake his head and say, what a bunch of ignorant know-nothings. 
he was looking at them and saying to himself, these are lost souls who need to hear the truth. He didn't ridicule them and say, I can't believe you guys follow all this. He said, let me tell you about the God you don't know. So when we look at what Paul did here, we need to ask ourselves, are we aware of people around us who are willing to believe? What do I mean by that? And i am be honest with you, I had to have somebody else point this out to me. Because a lot of times I would see symbols that people would wear on their t-shirts or their hats or their bumper stickers that told me they believe in God and they believe, they wanted to believe in Jesus, even though they may not have been correct on it, it should have told me, here's someone who's interested in, in the Word of God. Have you ever been into a restaurant and seen somebody over in the corner that's studying their Bible? You know what that tells you? They're interested in God. Now, that sounds kind of silly when you say that, but I can't tell you how many times I just skipped right over that because I was too busy doing something else. Let's be aware of our surroundings because there are people out there who are interested in finding out what God would have them to do. And we just need to be aware of it. Let me tell you a real story here. When I lived in Arkansas, my older sister lived with us. And she was selling her car to a fella. And she said, I don't feel comfortable going by myself. Can you come with me? So I went. I stood off to the side while they worked out a deal. And while they were working out a deal, I looked at his car. And he had on the license plate where it would be in Arkansas. You don't have to have a front plate. But he had one of those spray-painted signs like you'd buy at a county fair. And it said, I love Jesus. And so when they were done conversing, I said, James, I see your sticker there. You go to church anywhere? He goes, oh, yeah, I go to this church over here. I said, James, we're just doing a study right now in the book of Romans. Why don't you come study with us sometime? And you know what? He did. And when he started coming three weeks in a row, I took him aside one day. I said, James, would you like to do a one-on-one -on -one study? He, you know what he said? Yes. And within one hour, when we study the examples of conversion in the book of Acts, you know what he said? I need to be baptized. And we baptized him. Because somebody a long time ago pointed out to me, little symbols like that, when some, somebody's got a sign on their car that says, I love Jesus, that is an opportunity. I wouldn't have always caught that. And I'm telling you this story just to help you see that also. We need to be aware, like the Apostle Paul, of the world around us, the people around us, and see. If somebody's wearing a chain that's got a cross on it or a fish or whatever it may be, don't just shake your head at them and say, oh, they just don't know any better. Go up to them and say, hey, I notice you're wearing this. Does that mean you're a believer in Jesus? You want to sit down and talk about it? You might be surprised who would say yes. And it may be, I could tell you more stories, but I'm not going to keep you here too long. I could tell you more stories about people who do simple things like that and end up saving souls because somebody said yes. Let's be aware of those religious symbols. and Let's be familiar with even some of the religious writers. They may not be teaching the full truth on everything, but we can start with what they say and point them back to scriptures and what the truth does say. And let's be honest with ourselves. Are we seeking to save souls or ridicule their error? Let us seek rather to save souls. As Paul said, that he became all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Paul knew he wasn't going to save every soul in the city of Athens, but he thought, if I can just teach the truth, there's got to be somebody out there that's interested and might obey. So are we using everything possible that we can to reach out to lost souls? If not, we need to be. And then finally, let's note here that when Paul was in Athens, when he took that opportunity... He said, I'm going to tell you about this God that you don't know. And what did he teach them about God? Well, let me back up here. 
Let's note that he taught in verse 24 that this God whom they did not know is the God who made the world and everything in it. He taught them God as creator. He also taught them in verse 24 that he was greater than the creation itself because the way they looked at their gods, they had to feed their gods and they built these temples that would house their gods. Paul was saying God is greater than all these, this God you don't know. He made the world and everything in it since He is Lord of heaven and earth. He does not dwell in temples made with hands, as He was looking around at temples made with hands. He was also independent of man. Notice in verse 25, Nor is He worshipped with men's hands as though He needed anything, since He gives to all life, breath, and all things. They would literally bring food, their crops, to the temple for food for their gods. Paul is saying the true God doesn't need our help. He made all these things. He doesn't need man to give him sustenance. But again, he noted that he is the creator of all men. Verse 26, He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Paul pointed out that they were under the control of God's direction rather than the other way around. God predetermined the places and times of all nations. He was not limited, as they saw gods back then, to political boundaries. This was the God who was over all men. What was the purpose of Paul doing this? Telling them about God doing what he did. Verse 27, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for Him and find Him, though He is not far from each one of them. But he also said in verse 28, to demonstrate that He was the provider rather than they were the provider to God or gods. For in Him we live and move and have our being. It wasn't the fact of them making sure their gods could live and move and have their being. They had it backwards. He taught them that the Creator is greater than the creation. Verses 29 and 30. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art of man's devising. Truly, this times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. In other words, God was lenient with man in times past in his idolatry, but no longer. We can't keep living like this. Paul taught them about the judgment that was certain. Verse 31, because he's commanded all men everywhere to repent. Verse 31, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And of course, you and I know he's speaking about Jesus Christ. So for us today, when we look at what Paul did here, when we have finally an opportunity to teach someone, let us make sure we are teaching them about who God is. And again, in the world in which we live today, more and more often we're going to have to be teaching them a lot about God. But we need to teach them who He is. The fact that He created all things, that He is the creator of all things, that He is the God who is all-powerful and impartial and seeks the salvation of all men. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4, He desires that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. He is not willing that any should perish. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, that's the God we need to be teaching. Because the world doesn't know that God. The world more and more in which we live is saying, God is so mean, He's going to send all these people to hell, and that seems unfair to me. And you can show them the true God, that that's not what He wants. But we also need to, like Paul, teach God's eternal purpose, that is, trying to save us. Salvation was not an afterthought. He planned for our salvation, and He put it within every man, as we just saw that we would seek Him. He wants us to seek Him and find Him that we can be saved. The evidence is there within Scripture. If we can get them to the Scripture, we can show them that evidence. And we need to point them to this so they can see God's purpose. But we also need to preach the judgment. 
Let's not shy away from this. It is not going to be pleasant. We know that. But they need to know. The world needs to know. There will be a judgment. It is appointed to man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Hebrews 9, verse 27. The fact that we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Romans 14, verse 10, and 2 Corinthians 5, and verse 10. And we're going to have to give an account for all the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. We do the ungodly and the unbelieving world no favors by hiding this or deceiving them into thinking that everybody's going to eventually be saved regardless. So, are we preaching about God and His Word fully? What we find in the end was that there were results from this. Notice in verse 34, when, Jesus, when Paul said all this, Some mock, verse 32, some mock. Some are going to ridicule you today. And I know we know that too. Some are going to ridicule the idea of a resurrection from the dead or miracles or anything else in the Scripture. But I want us to also note some are going to put it off. They said, well, we'll hear you again on this matter. Almost kind of like uh, was it Felix or... Agrippa, I will hear you again on this matter. Or Felix was the one who said, I will call for you for a more convenient season. And do, you, do we ever read about him doing that? No. There are going to be some people who just put it off because they don't want to answer. But I want us to also note that as it says here, verse 34, however, some men joined him and believed. We're not going to save every soul out there. But brethren, if we do the things that Paul did... It may be that we run across a heart that is honest with the truth and it is seeking salvation and they will be listening and some will obey. The question is, what are we doing? And for those of you all here tonight, regardless, no matter what happens, we have to continue preaching God and His Word in this ungodly world. And it may be that there is somebody out there who is willing to hear that and they will... They will respond positively and they will want to be saved and those honest hearts who are willing to hear the truth it may be that we run across somebody who is saved but friends we're not going to have 100 percent success in saving every soul but i can guarantee you we will have zero percent if we do nothing let's get out there and teach the word of god to this ungodly world in which we live do everything we can. Let's follow the example of Paul here and do what he did. And we're going to see some of the same results. We have to trust that the Word of God is the power of God to salvation. Always has been, always will be. We need to trust that that's true. We don't need to resort to gimmicks. We, need, we don't need to offer material, fleshly offerings to get people in the door. We just simply need to do what Paul did. Now, this lesson is not one that would teach you what to do to become a Christian, but if you are here tonight and you have heard the gospel message and you believe it to be true, that teaches that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, you need to act on that conviction. Jesus himself said, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. That is still true today. The very first time the gospel was preached and people heard that they had crucified the Son of God and asked men and brethren, what must we do? Peter replied, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of your sins. That is still true. Have you done that? If not, why are you waiting? Salvation is now in your hands if you know what the truth is. Maybe you're here tonight as somebody who's already obeyed the gospel at some point in the, in the past, but you've not been walking faithfully with the Lord. Or you're here tonight and you know there is sin in your life. You need God's forgiveness. Take care of that tonight before you go home. Or if you're here tonight, you just need the prayers of this congregation for help in some way. Whatever your need, will you come as we stand and sing?